the time Congressional Reconstruction took full force in 1868, there were independent chapters of the KKK all over the South. Their tactics were brutal and terrifying. Klan members whipped black people who they considered rude or impudent to whites. They threatened teachers and burned black schools to intimidate those who sought an education. And most of all, they threatened black voters during election seasons. In this way, the Klan served as a paramilitary tool of the Democratic Party, attempting to scare Republicans away from the polls. Victims often received visits in the middle of the night by large groups of Klansmen masked and dressed in elaborate costumes. Then they would be beaten, their homes would be burned down, or they would be lynched in cold blood. Whites were victims as well as blacks. This cartoon, which appeared in an Alabama newspaper in 1868, predicts what might happen on March 4th of the following year, the day that new Republican congressmen were set to begin their terms. Two white men hang from a tree. One clutches a carpet bag in his hand, labeled Ohio. Note that the KKK is symbolized by a donkey, the traditional symbol of the Democratic Party. Between 1868 and 1870, the main years of radical reconstruction, Klan violence reached horrific levels. 1,000 political murders occurred in Louisiana before the 1868 presidential election. In Georgia, three Scalawag members of the state legislature were murdered. The violence could prove effective. Georgia and Louisiana were the only two former Confederate states not to vote for the Republican Ulysses S. Grant that year. In 1868, General Ulysses S. Grant, the greatest Union hero of the Civil War, was elected president as a Republican. He was a supporter of congressional or radical reconstruction. Grant defeated Democrat Horatio Seymour, who called Reconstruction unconstitutional and revolutionary. Republicans would enjoy political success for decades after the Civil War by waving the bloody shirt, reminding voters that the Democrats had been the party of secession and rebellion. As president, Grant sincerely wanted to secure the civil and political rights of freedmen. He was particularly horrified by all the atrocities still being committed by the Ku Klux Klan. Federal troops in the South had proved unable to end the Klan's brand of guerrilla terrorism. At Grant's urging, Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. It allowed the President to send U.S. Marshals into the South and arrest thousands of Klansmen. The act even suspended habeas corpus, meaning that the government did not have to prove that suspects were Klan members in order to arrest and detain them. Grant's strong actions virtually destroyed the original KKK, but it was quickly replaced in the South by other white supremacist groups, like the Red Shirts and the White League, dedicated to suppressing the black vote. By the 1870s, the mood of the nation and of the Republican Party had shifted significantly. Few Republicans still called themselves radicals, and many moderates had come to view Reconstruction as an expensive, never-ending quagmire. Trying to conquer and reform the South, at gunpoint, had consumed the Union for more than a decade. Many Northerners had simply grown weary of the struggle, and believed Reconstruction had been accomplished as well as it possibly could be under the circumstances. Despite the violent resistance to Reconstruction, these Republicans became open to letting Southerners once again control their own affairs, regardless of the consequences for civil rights. Although President Grant never truly held this belief, there is no denying that much of the air was let out of Reconstruction during his presidency. Numerous scandals in his administration also embarrassed Grant and made him seem like a weak leader, despite his popularity. In 1872, a number of anti-Grant Republicans briefly formed the Liberal Republican Party and nominated a candidate to run against him. Newspaper publisher Horace Greeley, one of the Liberals' demands was that the government remove its troops from the South and restore home rule in the region. Greeley became the Democratic Party's nominee as well, although Grant, who was still committed to Reconstruction, easily defeated him for a second term in 1872. You can see the results on the map here. But in 1874, for the first time since the Civil War, Democrats won control of the House of Representatives. It was a sure sign of a changing political mood across the country. As one Republican summed it up, 
voters had grown tired of the Negro question with all its complications and the reconstruction of southern states with all its interminable embroilments. Reconstruction had become unpopular, and so it seemed had Grant's Republican Party. Support for Reconstruction continued to decline. By the 1870s, the Freedmen's Bureau had lost most of its funding and staff. In 1872, Congress terminated the agency for good. Also abandoned, in large part, was military occupation. After the Civil War, more than 20,000 soldiers were stationed in the South to keep the peace. By 1870, the number was less than 7,000. By 1876, it was about 3,000. Congress did pass the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which banned segregation in transportation, in public facilities, and on juries. It was the last major piece of Reconstruction legislation to be passed. But the federal government did little to enforce the law, and it went largely ignored in the South, where segregation of the races was becoming the rule. In 1883, the Supreme Court would declare the Civil Rights Act unconstitutional. Other Supreme Court decisions would weaken the federal government's ability to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments. One important example is the case United States v. Crickshank, decided in 1875. In Louisiana, a very close state election in 1872 led both Republicans and Democrats there to declare victory. Violence followed and a militia of white Democrats attacked an armed group of black Republicans who were defending a courthouse. Three white men and more than 100 black men were killed in what became the Colfax Massacre. Many were executed after surrendering. The exact number of deaths was never determined, as the bodies of many freedmen were dumped in a river or buried in a mass grave. President Grant's Justice Department brought federal charges against several of the attackers, not for murder, but for violating the victims' rights to equal protection of the laws. But the Supreme Court, in the Cruikshank ruling, said that the 14th Amendment did not protect the victims as their rights had not been violated by the state of Louisiana, but by private individuals. Those individuals could only be tried in local courts but Louisiana juries would not convict even a single one of the attackers. This and similar decisions undermined the federal protections Congress had hoped to give freedmen when the 14th and 15th Amendments were ratified. Without the federal power to enforce civil rights, the Grant administration largely stopped trying. As the North retreated politically from Reconstruction, Democrats in the South successfully harnessed the anger of most Southern whites to replace bayonet rule with home rule. These Democrats called themselves Redeemers, and their mission was to remove Southern Republicans from power and restore white supremacy. They weren't subtle about it either. This presidential campaign ribbon for Horatio Seymour shows the Democrats' motto in 1868, This is a white man's country let white men rule. The Redeemer's strategy to re-establish white supremacy had two parts. First, they worked to consolidate all Southern whites into the Democratic Party by alienating white Republicans. Local papers printed the names of whites who collaborated with freedmen or voted Republican. These people found themselves socially cast out of their communities or even became the victims of violence. Democrats pointed out, not incorrectly, that most freedmen who could not afford land paid few taxes, while the taxes of white landowners were high because of Reconstruction. Was it not time, Redeemers urged, for them to keep more of their money by joining the white man's party? In the 1870s, fewer and fewer Southern whites became willing to call themselves Republicans. Second, Redeemers continued to suppress the black vote through intimidation and terrorism. The Colfax Massacre was just one example of what could happen to African Americans who stood up for their political rights. Despite the 15th Amendment's guarantee of their right to vote, black men increasingly risked their lives if they exercised that right on Election Day. Tragically, many freedmen made the difficult decision to protect their homes and their families rather than cast a ballot. The federal government did little to interfere with this process. In 1876, as Mississippi's elections neared and black voter intimidation was rampant, the state's governor pleaded to Washington for federal troops. The U.S. Attorney General responded that the public are tired of these annual election outbreaks in the South. One by one, Redeemers won back state governments for the Democrats. 
By 1877, every state of the former Confederacy had a democratic government, just as they had before the Civil War. 1876 was an election year, and President Grant's last year in office. Reconstruction was failing, and with it the civil rights achievements that had briefly transformed the South after the Civil War. But rather than facing the challenge, Northerners and Republicans were turning their backs on what many called the Southern Problem. Nationwide disgust over Republican political scandals meant that the Democrat, Samuel J. Tilden, had a real shot at the presidency. The New York governor ran as a reformer targeting the Grant administration and the supposed corruption of Republican governments in the South. The election was one of the closest in American history. Tilden won about 264,000 more popular votes, those cast by voters, than his Republican opponent, Ohio Governor Rutherford B. Hayes. But in the Electoral College, which actually determines the winner, the election was too close to call. The electoral votes of three southern states, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, were in dispute. These states were the only ones in the South that were not yet under Redeemer governments. Both Democrats and Republicans claimed victory in those states and sent conflicting electoral votes to be counted by Congress. This put Congress in the position of determining who had really won the three states in question. Whoever it picked would be the new president. Congress appointed a 15-man special commission composed of members of the House, Senate, and Supreme Court. It was split between seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and one man without a clear party preference. Predictably, all the Democrats voted for Tilden, and all the Republicans voted for Hayes. The remaining member voted for Hayes as well, giving all the electoral votes of the disputed states to the Republican, who was declared the winner by exactly one vote, 185 to 184. Democrats were outraged at what they considered to be a stolen election, especially since Tilden had won the popular vote. They called the decision the monster fraud of the century, and many said they would never accept Hayes as president. Congressional Democrats threatened to filibuster or block the committee's decision all the way until March 2, 1877, two days before the new president was to be inaugurated. At that point, behind-the-scenes negotiations finally yielded a compromise. Republicans agreed to withdraw all remaining soldiers from the South in exchange for Democrats' acceptance of Hayes as president. In addition, Republicans promised to give the South economic aid and to appoint a Democrat to President Hayes' cabinet. The so-called Compromise of 1877 allowed Rutherford B. Hayes to be peacefully sworn in as president on March 4th. Officially, there was no Compromise of 1877. The informal agreement between Democrats and Republicans was never written down, and many of the details surrounding it remain unclear. But the inauguration of President Hayes marks the end of Reconstruction. Would things have turned out differently if Hayes had won a more decisive victory? It's unlikely. As you've learned, Reconstruction was over in all but name by the 1876 election. Neither candidate was enthusiastic about continuing it. In many ways, the South had turned back the clock after Reconstruction, returning the region to a status quo not unlike what had existed before the Civil War. The South would be solidly democratic for generations to come. No former Confederate state would even cast a single electoral vote for a Republican president until 1920. A handful of black congressmen continued to represent congressional districts in the South in the 1880s and 1890s. After that, no former Confederate state would send a black man or woman to Washington until 1973. No black senator would represent a southern state again until the year 2013. For African Americans in the South, the end of Reconstruction meant that the 14th and 15th Amendments became laws in name only. By the 1890s, conditions actually worsened for black men and women. Historians call it the nadir of race relations, the low point for black civil rights in America after the Civil War. Jim Crow segregation would legally create two societies in the South, one for white citizens and another, separate but certainly not equal, for black citizens. Lynching would become frighteningly common. The practice would not peak until 1892. Generations of Southern blacks remained trapped in poverty as sharecroppers.
and political white supremacy made it almost unheard of for blacks to vote, despite the Constitution's clear guarantee of that right. It would take almost another century until the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s for Reconstruction to be, in a sense, revived and completed. The era of Reconstruction is not a story with a happy ending. You've learned about its successes, but ultimately about its failure. The end of slavery created tremendous responsibilities for reshaping the region that had historically been the least free part of the United States. And reformers and free people alike made impressive progress towards that goal in the face of intense opposition. Reconstruction was, in some ways, the most progressive period of American history up to that point. But Americans lacked the will and the determination to see the project to its conclusion. North and South, they turned away from guaranteeing the rights promised by their own constitution. All Americans would suffer from this in the long run, not just black Americans. Some say that Reconstruction was doomed to failure. It was too much change, too soon, for the United States in the mid-1800s. Perhaps, considering human nature and the larger forces of history, that is the case. What is definitely the case is that Reconstruction continues to be one of the most misunderstood periods of our history. America didn't just abandon Reconstruction politically. They also abandoned their memories of the era's accomplishments. In the early 20th century, a school of historical thought came to dominate America's views of this era. It even has a name, the Dunning School. For William Dunning and his fellow historians, Reconstruction failed because black citizens had been in charge of it. They were unfit for the responsibility and unprepared to vote, hold office, or exercise civil rights because they were racially inferior. In this view, Negro rule was so corrupt and so chaotic that Southern whites were basically forced to take their country back, redeeming the South and returning blacks to their proper place. The Dunning School version of Reconstruction justified Jim Crow and white supremacy. It became widely accepted by most Americans after it entered the history textbooks of the early 20th century, where it became the standard view of Reconstruction taught to generations of Americans. And it was reinforced culturally by the wildly popular 1915 film The Birth of a Nation, which packaged these lies as entertainment for mass audiences. Today's historians have a much more complex and much more accurate understanding of why Reconstruction actually failed. In the end, its opponents were more determined to see it fail than its champions were determined to see it succeed. In this tutorial, we've tried to steer clear of some of the misunderstandings about this era that linger on down to the present.